so let's um, get going. So what you basically have to imagine here, you have a um, you know, ferritic steel, for instance. Um, in the middle of the grain, we have a piece of screw dislocation that has double cross-slipped, and that is generating dislocation loops, one after the other. They expand, and then they reach um, the, uh, the uh, grain boundary. So you've got a set of dislocations which repel each other, yeah? and, um, and so they exert a back stress on the dislocations that are generated by the Frank uh, Reed source. Hmm? And uh, these are generated by the externally applied force. Hmm? Okay? So obviously, the, uh, this, this uh, back stress, yeah, the size of these back this back stress will be determining, will be determined, excuse me, by the number of dislocations in the pileup. Hmm? Okay? So, uh, as is as written here, so the Frank Reed source will stop producing dislocations when this back stress is large enough to prevent further emissions of dislocations from the source. And then the number of uh, dislocations in a pileup um, is determined uh, uh, by the back stress. Hmm? So we'll, and we will use what we know of dislocation theory to, um, to get some uh, quantitative values here. Hmm? So we assume we have let me get some point. Yeah. So we have an applied stress, which we call tau, tau A, acting on the slip plane, hmm? where, where, where you have the, the source and where you have the pileup. Yeah? Okay. Now, the pileup, yeah? the pileup works, yes? works as a magnifying, a magnifier of the stress that you apply. And you, I'm not proving this, right? Um, just take my word for it. That's, um, that's one of the uh, things I get from um, dislocation theory, is that the, um, the, the, the stress that is, so this is the grain boundary, and this is the stress. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what is the stress on this uh, uh, first dislocation? If, it's, if you have n dislocations, the same dislocation, piled up again, yes? Well, dislocation theory uh, tells me that this, um, the effect of this pileup is to magnify the stress, shear stress acting on this dislocation. Yeah? So normally, it would be applied force times Burgers factor, yeah? Now it's n times the applied force times Burgers factor times the length of the dislocation. So, and we just um, forget about the length and drop the Burgers factor. And, and so we, we, we say the, so the, 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 the stress on the leading dislocation of this pile up is n times the applied shear stress. Hmm? Right, so now the question is, Right, so I, I can know what this stress, shear stress is, yeah, if I know n, all right? So again here, I use uh, uh, a result from this location theory about these, uh, these pileups, yes? So n is equal to, so a number of constants, pi, g, b, and k1 are constants in this thing. Hmm? Um, you have two uh, parameters. One is the applied um, um, applied uh, uh, shear stress, and L, the length of my um, pileup. Okay? So, the, um, so, so the, in that situation, what, what we calculate is the, the moment where you have n 
n dislocations, forming a pileup of length l over the, their distance is an l, a distance l uh, at the time that they will prevent the source from creating more dislocations you know, in, in that equilibrium state. Yes? Okay? So, okay. Say I have applied less force, right? Then I apply less force, then n is smaller, right? Because, so if I apply a big force, yes, I, I will push a lot of uh, dislocations against the barrier before the back stress balances the applied shear stress. Yeah? If my applied shear stress is very small, the number of dislocations here will be small too, right? Because you won't need to have this much back stress to stop the source from generating dislocations, okay? So, um, okay. So, so, um, so, so uh, the, the number of uh, dislocations per unit length of the uh, the pileup mm -hmm. n over l is is a function of the applied uh, force shear force. All right. And if you uh, uh, look at this, it's as if it's uh, equivalent to stating that if you have a uh, a pileup of n dislocations, it you can pretty much think of it as a single dislocation with a very large Burgess vector. Hmm? So the equ this is equivalent to a big dislocation with not a Burgess vector b, but a vector b times n. Hmm? And it kind of makes sense, you know, if the dislocations are very close to each other, you have all these extra half planes. Yes, so, uh, so it kind of magnifies the um, the Burgers factor. Right, so n is the length, l is the length of the slip planes with these piled up dislocations. T is the applied stress. K1 is a constant here in this parameter. Uh, it's, um, again, you know, uh, coming from dislocation theory. So K1 is 1 for screw dislocations and is 1 minus the Poisson ratio for edge dislocation. So it's very simple. Uh, parameter. So the stress uh, at the grain boundary, yes, on this on this particular dislocation, yes, uh, is now. So this was my equation here. N times the applied stress. So I just take this, this here, and I multiply it with tau a, right? Simply, so these two equations together give me, not surprisingly, tau one is. Uh, pi k1 divided by gbl times tau a square. Okay? Okay? And now, obviously, this solves everything, and this assumption is made by multiple, in multiple theories. Yeah? Uh, you make the step and you say, well, the length of the um, uh, pileup is related to the grain, bound, the grain diameter. Yeah? If I have small grains, I will necessarily have smaller, smaller grain sizes. Hmm? If, if I have small grains, excuse me, I will have smaller pileups. It's it's um, it's kind of reasonable, yes. Okay. So, and and then very often uh, in this theory, in the theory, uh, people say, well, it's probably close to two, half a grain size. So L is half a grain size or thereabouts. You, know, you don't have to assume it's uh, half. Uh, and and then and and then you find. Taiwan is equal to 
so okay, that's the same equation you saw on the last slide, okay? Right, and now uh, what you say is, if this, the shear stress that's, work, that's pushing this dislocation uh, into the boundary here, so uh, n times tau applied, yes? Uh, so which, which is equal to uh, uh, the uh, tau square times L, um, yes, and, and all the other parameters which are constants, yes? Um, if that shear stress is high enough, yes, one set of theory, one theory says, if that's the case, if you reach if, you, if this reaches a critical value, then you will have breakthrough. This, this slip will somehow generate dislocation at the grain boundary and, and you'll have a uh, breakthrough, burst through uh, the, uh, uh, the grain boundary. So the piled up dislocations can burst through the grain boundary when you reach a critical stress tau c. Hmm? So, uh, if tau 1, which is n times tau a, is larger or equal than this critical uh, uh, shear stress, then you will have uh, um, uh, your, your uh, movement of the, the slip through, propagation of the slip through your grains. Yes? So, uh, and then you, re so you basically rearrange this. You, uh, you first get uh, tau a square, and then you tau a, and you find, not surprisingly, one over square root of the grain size. Hmm? That's uh, reasonable. Um, the thing that's unreasonable about this model is, of course, that we know dislocations will very rarely cross boundaries, yes? So what uh, uh, other theories, other, another theory says, and that's the Cottrell theory you may have heard of, yes? They say, well, this large shear stress you have here, yes, is actually not used to burst through the grain boundary, but to activate a source that's into the adjacent grain, yes? Okay? So, so alternatively, the, the piled up dislocations cause a Frank Reed dislocation source to generate dislocation as adjacent grain. And the way the original theory is built up is um, they, they, they look at the, this pile up as a, a shear crack. Yes, and they then determine on the basis of the geometry here, the maximum shear stress at a distance r from this crack. And you can, you can show that this shear stress is equal to the applied stress times the square root of the um, grain size divided by four times r, r being the distance between the grain boundary and the Frank Reed source in the grain. And so now, again, if uh, this shear stress is larger than a critical stress to activate a Frank Reed source, uh, then I have a, a propagation of slip. And so just simply by rearranging this equation, you can see that the applied stress is again proportional to one over the square root of d in this case. All right, so this is um, uh, in general how people try to make uh, sense of the um, one over square root d uh, relation that we observe in, in the Hall patch equation for steels, but um, it's, it's 
when you go into the, some details, it turns out that these models uh, miss a lot of the um, features of the process. And, um, and we'll talk about two features. The first feature is the fact that grain boundaries have properties too, yes? And in fact, grain boundaries can emit dislocations themselves, can be sources of dislocations, yes? That's one thing. And second, um, uh, grain boundaries are places where you have what we call strain incompatibilities. So you have grains deform and two adjacent grains deform and where they meet there is what we call strain incompatibility and that gives rise to, you know, we'll talk about this in a moment, geometrically necessary dislocations, yes, and that may be um, in other theories uh, the source of um, strengthening, grain size strengthening. So, so what's the problem with, one of the problems with the dislocation pileup models? Well, it does not explain why, for instance, interstitial carbon and nitrogen are affecting the hull patch slope differently. Hmm? So um, carbon and nitrogen have an effect on the, uh, the stress needed to unlock dislocations, so the, yes, from their atmospheres, but carbon has a very noticeable influence on the hull patch um, parameter K for ferrite. Hmm? Okay, so what, what, well basically that's, that's what you see here. Hmm? For instance, if you have, you, you have the hull patch relation for an IF steel, doesn't contain any carbon, yes? You get a very low K value, KY value. You add some carbon, yes, in solution, so low, low amounts of carbon, of course, and you see that the more you add carbon, the higher K becomes. Now, um, the way you can understand K, if you want like a physical explanation for K, K tells you how difficult is it to, for um, deformation to pass through the boundary. Yes? So the higher K value, the higher, the, uh, the, the, the more difficult it is to propagate slip across the boundary. Hmm? So why would carbon have that influence? Yes? There's no mechanism in, the, in, the, in these pileup theories that can account for this. Yeah? You see nitrogen, uh, very low... Uh, uh, effects uh, of uh, nitrogen on the K value in the hull patch equation. Uh, but in austenitic steels, you see the same also for nitrogen. You see that as we add nitrogen to our austenitic steels, the K value increases dramatically. Yes? So it basically tells you that suddenly um, your grain size effect is improved just because you have some nitrogen. So obviously there's something more than just the size of the grain that plays a role. Yeah? And that is the, the, the properties of the grain boundary are also important in uh, the hull patch relation. Hmm? Okay? So, um, right, so the, the problem is the effect of carbon and nitrogen decision. So we, we have to think of the fact that the role of grain boundaries is also important. And there are some models which takes that into consideration. Mm -hmm. And so the, the grain boundaries are assigned a more active role. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, that's being done by just saying, well, the grain boundaries emit dislocations. They act as sources of dislocation. So you have to... Uh, and. and um, there are ways to show that. Uh, if you have ledges on grain boundaries, like steps, yes, it is possible, yes, from a purely geometrical point of view, to, uh, to have these ledges produce uh, dislocations, you know, be dislocation sources. 
And um, in this case, well, I'm not going to do all the details, but in this case, you, um, you make use of um, the, uh, the equation we, we know, which relates the flow stress or the flow shear stress to the dislocation density, square root of the dislocation density. Dislocation, yes, this being the dislocation densities. And we make use of this plus an experimental observation that dislocation densities are proportional to one over the grain size. Yeah. And so when we do this, when we combine these two type of equations, we find that the, shear st the flow stress is proportional to one over the square root of the grain size again. Hmm? So, all right. Right, so that's this alternative. The method is a little bit more uh, worked out here, the text, but that's basically uh, the same. Let's, let's uh, read through uh, the text here. Whole patch uh, Cottrell approach uh, uh, was criticized on the basis of experimental observations. Uh, namely the, the carbon and the nitrogen effect. And there's another effect that um, uh, reason why um, people uh, d d uh, have objections against the pileup model is because if you take steels, yes, and you deform steels and you look into the uh, grain boundary region, you don't see pileups. Yes? You don't see burst throughs either, but you certainly don't see pileups. Yes? The reason is that in ferrite, yes, once you have this location, which feels a pretty high force building, it just cross slips. It just, you know, says forget it. I'm not, I'm not standing in this row of uh, dislocations that, that's compressed. I just cross them. So there, these, um, um, uh, there are no um, um, uh, pileups in, in ferrite, basically. Yeah. All right. So, and you cannot explain the, the carbon and the nitrogen effect. Right, and so you can, uh, this is the relation uh, that uh, between the dislocation density uh, and the, 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 the size of the grain here, yeah? And, and this is a more or less an experimental observation, strong experimental observation, yeah? And then you, uh, you, you plug this into the, the relation between the shear stress and the square root of the dislocation density, and that's what we just, this here. Hmm? So, uh, so the, the properties of the, the grain boundary are important. And so the question is now, can we explain uh, perhaps uh, what the effect is of the carbon? Yes. Well, the, the, the thing is we know that when we have carbon in, uh, in ferritic steels, the carbon will, the solute carbon will very uh, likely be um, uh, segregated in grain boundaries, yes? And there it will strengthen the grain boundary. And one of the things that it's believed to do is make it harder for dislocations to be generated at the boundary, yes? And that's the reason why you get a, a steeper slope. It becomes harder to generate dislocations at the boundary, yeah? And the more carbon you have, the steeper the slope becomes, yes? Why don't we see it for nitrogen? Because nitrogen doesn't do this. Nitrogen, uh, in contrast to carbon, doesn't particularly uh, uh, favor grain boundaries for some reason. It will stay pretty much homogeneously distributed. Yes? Yes. So um, th that is probably the reason why uh, uh, there is this uh, uh, compositional effect. Hmm? 
Right. Um, so, because so you can read this um, uh, when you look at the slides, but there is also this um, this idea that is um, very important, hmm, where um, people have said, "But look, um, it, when you when you you know when you're deforming a crystal and you deform another crystal with another orientation, yes." Uh, so I have a, a crystal here, and I let it deform, yes? And say this crystal doesn't care about the other grains around it, yes? Then these dislocations will arrive at the end of, this, uh, of their, uh, their slip plane, and they'll move out of the crystal, yes? Making steps, steps that suddenly the boundary will have steps. And the other grain will do the same thing, yes? So soon enough, if you let all the grains do that, uh, you'll find that necessarily there will be grains, grain boundaries that are uh, holes, have become holes, and other uh, grain boundaries where I don't know how they uh, uh, fix that, yes? Uh, but you know, there's material, extra material, yes? So obviously that cannot happen, right? So what happens, in order to avoid this happening, yes, um, the, the person's name who's associated with it, Ashby, said, well, in order to avoid this, these volumes that are too much or not enough, yeah, missing material or too much material, that's just dislocations, special ge ge dislocation. Geometrically necessary dislocations, yes? Yeah, they, they're being introduced in the model for geometrical reasons. If we don't introduce them, you know, your crystals, your, your polycrystal will contain uh, overlapping material or holes, yes? And that cannot happen, so I introduce these geometrically necessary dislocations. On top, on top of the normal dislocations, yes? So, and so we have two groups of dislocations, the statistically necessary dislocations, statistically stored dislocations, are they called, or these geometrically necessary dislocations. We'll, t we'll talk more about them and how you can derive their density uh, later on uh, at another stage of the, the course, because they pop up any time you have a problem with strain, so one thing, one part of the solid deforms, the other part deforms also, but it's not compatible at the interface. One of the ways to resolve the issue is by introducing geometrically necessary dislocations. Yeah? Right. So um, you get small grains, you've got, you'll, you know, you'll need more geometrically necessary dislocations. And that's the relation now between why is it that I need, I have more flow stress is because if the grain size is smaller, I need more of these geometrically uh, uh, necessary dislocation. And we know the flow stress is proportional to the square root of the dislocation density. Yeah? Okay. So it's basically a dislocation model. Yeah? And, and so, uh, so with smaller grain sizes, we get a higher rate of dislocation accumulation, and because tau is proportional to um, the square root of dislocations, yes, and and so uh, this becomes uh, increases as the grain size decreases, yes. That's that's the that becomes the the connection, as it were. So there, there's no uh, so in this model. There's no need to uh, to, to have uh, uh, pileups at all. Hmm? No need for pileups. Hmm? Uh, so first, uh, so, so the two reasons are you have the uh, the strain incompatibility, yes, due to the difference in crystal, uh, crystalline orientation, leads to the formation of these extra dislocations because there's this, like you need these extra dislocations here. Yeah? Uh, in addition to the statistically accumulated dislocation. This is the one that gives you regular slip, yeah? 
And so the total dislocation density is increased by these, this density. Okay. And uh, second, uh, why do I have uh, more dislocation accumulation with small grains? Is that we get an, a reduction of the average slip distance of dislocations in smaller grains. Hmm? So I will need an increase in the dislocation density to achieve a specific strain. Yes? Because this, remember, the strain is a, a product of. Um, dislocation density times the distance that the dislocation move, right? So if I make the, uh, the, the distance, the dislocation can move smaller, but I still have to get the deformation, right? It's the only thing I can do is increase the dislocation density, right? Okay? And that's what happens. All right. So the picture that emerges hmm, is a very different picture from the original pile-up model. Yes, or dislocation uh, pileup breakthrough model is um, you have grain interiors where you have single slip, you know, certainly at the beginning of the uh, deformation, yes, and an accumulation of geometrically necessary dislocations at the at the boundary, yes. Okay, so in the, in the notes you will see um, uh, some equations, uh, theories uh, uh, that are based on pileup theories or uh, grain boundary dislocations uh, sources or geometrically necessary dislocation theories, uh, some equations that are derived from these theories, you can have a look at them. Um, and um, so how do we um, fit all this into what we um, had derived uh, uh, previously? So now if you say, um, you know, I have a steel, I have a grain size, um, and I want to know, um, you know, what, how do I put in my grain size in my equations for, to calculate the, the strength of the material? Hmm? So what you do, hmm, the strength of the material as a function of strain will be, excuse me, so you we should first uh, write the equations in terms of shear stress, shear strain. Yeah. Um, so first you do the lattice friction. That's, that's the critical result, shear stress. Okay? Okay, so if you do a calculation at room temperature, that is 19 megapascal or 20 megapascal. Then you add your solid solution strengthening effects. Yes? And then you add your um, um, if the effect of the grain size on the yield strength, right? So this ky divided by square root of t. Yes, you have to add this there, and then you have this. Uh, so at this point, the fourth term. Yes where you compute, as I showed you last, uh, uh, well, this week, earlier this week, um, where you compute the uh, evolution of the dislocation density with strain. And you remember there, we had a term, yes, for the uh, mean free path of the dislocations, yes? And that's where you put the uh, the term n, so you have one. So so here, if you remember, um, so you, there, so you, you numerically integrate this equation. Yes. Hmm? Uh, so here there is a constant. I'm trying to make sure I don't get this wrong. Hmm? 
like this, okay? This is the grain size, yes? So that's how you take, so you do the numerical integration of this equation here, yes? You have the grain size as a strong um, uh, boundary, yes? And that, that's in there, okay? This is how, that's how you can uh, put, or take into account the, uh, the grain size in the, the, the theory of strain hardening, yes? Okay, but you should not forget to, to add the, uh, the strengthening effect uh, for the yield strength, okay? Because the, um, this term here, it's just takes into uh, account the effect the grain size will have on dislocation accumulation, okay? And, and if you do that, you can actually check the, uh, you know, if the whole patch equation should hold, yes? Okay, there's another um, uh, uh, point that's interesting to look at because up to now what we've discussed are, uh, you know, we've talked about constructional steels, about ferrite basically, and in relation to the um, hull patch equation. But we have, there are many situations where we don't have, you know, we're not even talking about whether the grains are circular or not, you know. You know Look at this, Martin site. What, what's the grain size? You know, there's no, I mean, this, 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 uh, is there an equation for um, grain size for Martin site or for bainite? Bainite just looks very much like it, you know. Um, can we talk about microstructure refinement? Hmm? Um, and it's important because uh, martensite is a very, you know, very hard material, yes. And, um, and it's very widely used in, um, in um, uh, engineering applications. So originally to make this martensite, you can work with this ferrite and perlite uh, constructional steel and do thermal treatment and you get this very homogeneous microstructure, yes. Uh, and the question is now, is there, you know, can we uh, look at microstructure refinement in uh, st structures like my, uh, uh, martensite? Uh, and, and are there equations that resemble uh, hull patch uh, relations for this type of microstructure? And the answer is yes, actually. There, the, 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 you can uh, refine martensite. And, uh, and change the properties. Yeah. So, so the microstructure, first of all, we'll need to say something about martensite, in particular lath martensite. It consists of packets, yes? Okay, so you have uh, packets, which are formed within the original austenite grain. So you know martensite is, you get that when you quench austenite. Yeah? So you have the original uh, PAGB, so uh, prior austenite grain boundaries, yes? And inside you have, they, they are, uh, they consist of packets. And in these packets you have parallel blocks, okay? And these packets are typically 100 to 150 micron in size. So they, they can be uh, big, yeah? For a prior austenite grain size of, and this is again, thanks to Microsoft, this is micron, please. Uh, and these packets are subdivided into many parallel blocks. You see these parallel blocks here, which contain groups of narrow lats, yes? And when we talk about this microstructure here being lath martensite, that's the lats we talk about, yeah? about these narrow lats. Um, so the blocks are one to 15 micron thick, yes? And the lats are typically less than half, half a micron. Yes, again, I'll, I'll um, 
make sure that's corrected when I post it on uh, E-class e uh, tonight. Um, less than uh, half a micron thick. The lat size is independent of the prior austenite grain. And what's important here is that these lats, these very elongated lats, have the same habit plane. So although they look like very small units, they're actually highly oriented, yes? And they don't really work as grain boundaries, even though from a first view of them, they, they would look like them. In fact, if you, um, if you put this in a TM and you do diffraction patterns from these lats, groups of lats, you usually see a single crystal diffraction pattern, yes? Despite the fact that you have all these dislocations and interfaces, lat interfaces, yes? And that's because the or misorientation is very small. So the misorientation between lats is very, very small. Hmm? Uh, and then also, uh, within um, these blocks here, hmm, uh, we have the close-packed crystallographic planes of the lats within a packet are also nearly parallel. Yeah? So the crystallographic differences within blocks are small. Yes? Okay, so I also want to stress the dislocation density in martensite is very high. But because the crystallographic differences here yes, are very small, we never have very high angle boundaries there. And slip can easily propagate between the lats. So, the packets are meaningful structural units, yes, that you can work on, yes, to get a refinement effect for martensite. So the packet size, rather than lath width or block size, are the main grain size strengthening contribution in lath martensite. And you can see that if you plot, and, and how can I control the, the, the packet size? Well, very simply, by having smaller prior austenite grains. Yes, and you can see here, if I have a very small prior austenite grain size, I will also have a smaller packet size, yes? So it is meaningful to refine uh, uh, the martensite just as much as you can refine ferrite, ferritic steels or constructional steels, to get a whole patch effect. The structural unit that's of importance is the packet size, okay? So the whole patch actually applies to uh, low-carbon martensite, yes? But the D here is the packet size, and this D is controlled by the original austenite grain size. Hmm? And the reason is because you have high misorientation angles between packets, and, the back, and, and, and it's the packet boundaries that act as very efficient uh, barriers to dislocation motions. Hmm? And it works very well because uh, this is a fresh martensite at point to uh, carbon. You can see very nice um, hull patch relation. And you have a high value of KY, of, of the uh, um, uh, hull patch uh, parameter. Hmm? So, so transfer of slip across packet boundaries is difficult. Hmm? And um, Again here, just as in the case of regular steels, yes, uh, this very high resistance is believed to be related to, of course, the misorientation, but also the presence of carbon atoms at this boundary in the martensite. And the reason why we know that that's the case is because if if you temper the martensite, this is before tempering, this is after tempering. 
what happened to the slope of the whole patch equation. Instead, we have a nice high k value. We have almost flat. So suddenly, the microstructure hasn't changed, by the way, right? It's still lap Martensai. So suddenly, something has happened, yes, to make the packet boundary uh, much less of an obstacle to uh, propagation of deformation. And the reason is, well, the carbon. The carbon that used to be in the packet's boundaries is now not in the packet boundaries anymore. It's formed carbides. Yes? It's formed carbides. So, um, so, so what we get is the tempering of the Martin side has an effect on the packet size strengthening. It reduces the packet size dependence of the yield strength, yeah? so the, the slope here. Yeah? And it uh, reduces the work hardening rate of the Martin side as a consequence. So both effects are due to uh, carbide formation. Hmm? All right. So this pretty much uh, ends um, the, uh, the part I wanted to discuss about the, the grain boundary strengthening. And it, just to close uh, this afternoon session, so what's, what's important for you to, to realize is that um, you may have thought that um, whole patch equation and stuff, that's, you know, all, everything was settled. It's actually not, yes. Uh, there are still things we don't understand and know, yes. In particular, all, everything that's related to the grain boundary properties, yes. And um, that uh, our 1 over square root d uh, relation is, um, you know, may not actually hold, you know, in principle, if we, have the, if we ever find the right theory. Having said this, you know, working on reducing the grain size is very efficient from an engineering point of view. Yeah? So in the industry, uh, any metals industry, steel industry, uh, aluminum industries, working on refining the grain is very high, always very high priority uh, because you get very high strength effect. Having said this, I also illustrate the fact that uh, pushing this to the limit by having very tiny grains doesn't really make sense because you kill the plasticity. You can make it uh, totally uh, irrelevant. And finally, with the Martin side, very important also you can also refine, uh, it shows that you can also refine microstructures that look very tiny already. Like, and I said in particular for steels, uh, martensite and bainite. Uh, if you are able to refine the starting austenite microstructure, you will also refine the, um, the structural units in martensite and bainite and, and get an equivalent um, uh, effect. But don't forget, um, again, as I said, um, the, 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 the theoretical basis uh, for, for the strengthening is, is a little bit weak. So at, at this stage, uh, best thing to do is uh, uh, use, use your whole patch equation, yes, uh, but be very careful when you, you, you know, what KY value you use, because as I've shown, it's very, very sensitive to uh, the, the, the deformation, prior deformation, and it's very sensitive to composition. Yeah? Carbon, no carbon, uh, tempered, not tempered. So uh, be very careful when you uh, select a uh, KY value for your calculations. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, have a very pleasant weekend. <laughs>